Victor of Rome was a crucial figure in his own right and was perhaps the first true monarchical bishop of and the list of books considered to be part of the Holy Bible. It is the latter which concerns us here. The idea of having a list of sacred writings was not a Christian invention, but an inheritance from Second Temple Judaism and the Old Testament. By the way, I will not be discussing the history of the Christian Old Testament canon. That topic will be saved for a future episode. Jesus himself never wrote any books, nor, besides Revelation, ever commissioned the apostles to do so either. In the first century, both Jews and Greeks often considered oral tradition to be equally or more important than written tradition. But at some point, the impetus to write down a record of the words and deeds of Christ came about. Before and during this time, though, apostles such as Paul were already engaged in writing epistles to fellow Christians, using the oral tradition of the church as a source for authority. It was not self-evident in the first decades of the church that a new collection of holy writ would come about to stand alongside the Old Testament. Even in the time of the Apostolic Fathers, when Christian authors cited the scriptures, they were referring to the Old Testament, specifically the Greek Septuagint. But as the second century progressed, the writings of the apostles gradually became seen as comprising a New Testament. When did this process begin? How soon were the Gospels and Apostolic Epistles viewed as divine scripture? The second epistle of Peter Irenaeus' trip to the Eternal City in 177 would be the first of many interactions with the Roman Church. Sometime after the persecution in Gaul, but before the 190s AD, Irenaeus wrote to a Roman presbyter named Florinus. Florinus, like Irenaeus, had originally come from Asia, where he worked for the imperial government. Also like Irenaeus, Florinus had known Polycarp personally. personally though not as well as Irenaeus, it seems. At some point, Florinus had come to Rome, where he unfortunately became seduced by heresies akin to those of Marcion and Valentinus. Irenaeus' epistle to Florinus is titled, On the Authority of God, or That God is Not the Author of Evil. Like Marcion, Florinus had apparently been teaching that the creator of this world was an evil deity something in fierce contrast to Orthodox Christianity. Irenaeus reminded Florinus of Polycarp, and how Polycarp, if he heard what Florinus was teaching now, would condemn it as blasphemous and false. Polycarp had, after all, called Marcion the firstborn of Satan. Irenaeus' attempts to reach Florinus was not successful. The heretic continued to spread his teaching within the Catholic community, and the books he used to seduced more to his way. Thus Irenaeus wrote to the bishop, Victor, urging him to take action. Florinus was on good terms with his bishop, indicating Victor was woefully ignorant of the presbyter's true beliefs. Many Roman Christians were accepting of Florinus because of his standing with their bishop and his ecclesiastical rank. Irenaeus advised Victor to examine Florinus's heresy and expel his heretical books from the Roman Church. Around this time, 
another presbyter had separated himself from the Roman church named Blastus. He too received an epistle from Irenaeus on the subject of schism. It is not known exactly what it was, though, that caused Blastus to break from the Roman congregation. Victor of Rome was a crucial figure in his own right, and was perhaps the first true monarchical bishop of Rome. He was bishop from 189 to 199. It is possible he was the first Latin-speaking bishop of Rome due to his African origin. Victor had contacts with the imperial court through Emperor Commodus's favorite mistress, Marcia. It is not certain if Marcia herself was a Christian, or merely a Christian sympathizer. Victor was able to contact her through a presbyter named Hyacinthus, a eunuch at the imperial court. By virtue of his connection to Marcia, Victor secured the release of Christian confessors from the hellish mines of Sardinia. Among them was the future bishop of Rome, Callistus, whom we shall have cause to deal with. In a future episode. By far, though, the most famous deeds for which Victor is remembered were those actions of his which brought him into direct conflict with Irenaeus. In the 190s AD, a new controversy arose within the great church. This controversy would be even larger than the Montanus heresy two decades earlier and would engulf the churches of Rome, Asia, Gaul, Achaea, Palestine, and even Mesopotamia, almost the entire Christian world. What was this controversy about, you ask? The date of Easter, of course. You may remember back in episode 13 how Polycarp of Smyrna and Anachetus of Rome disagreed over when the Feast of the Resurrection was to be celebrated. Polycarp followed the tradition of the churches of Asia, which held that Easter was to be celebrated on the 14th of Nisan in the Jewish calendar, regardless of what day of the week it fell. This was known as the Quartodeciman practice. This tradition was traced back to the Apostle John. But the Church of Rome, along with all the other churches, followed the tradition that Easter was to be held always on the Sunday following the 14th of Nisan. In Polycarp's day, he and Anachetus had decided to agree to disagree concerning the matter. But a generation later, Victor of Rome felt otherwise. The controversy flared up all around the Christian world, and councils gathered and weighed in on the issue. With the exception of the Asian bishops, there was universal agreement that Easter should always be held on the Sunday. The churches of Palestine, such as Jerusalem and Caesarea, even cited the Church of Alexandria in Egypt as evidence to support the majority practice. In defense of the Cordodeciman practice, Polycrates, Bishop of Ephesus, wrote an eloquent epistle to Victor of Rome. In his defense, Polycrates cites great bishops of the past, such as Polycarp and Melito of Sardis, and the apostles John and Philip, all of whom, he says, followed the Quartodeciman practice. Given all this, it was hard to deny that the Quartodecimans were following an ancient apostolic custom. When this response from Polycrates reached Victor, the Bishop of Rome did something which brought down great opprobrium upon himself. Victor took the dramatic step of excommunicating all the Asian Christians in Rome who followed the Cordodeciman custom. Instead of supporting him, though, Victor received strong rebuke from the churches around the world, despite their agreement with his views. Chief among these was Irenaeus himself, who acted as a peacemaker and wrote a stern epistle to Victor. In his letter, Irenaeus reminded Victor that the Cordodeciman practice was ancient, that the Paschal fast varied from church to church as well and that his predecessor, Anachetus, did not break communion with Polycarp when they disputed the same issue. For Irenaeus, the diversity of traditions like these in the Catholic Church was not a bad thing. Far from it. For Irenaeus, they confirmed the unity of faith among the Orthodox brethren. 
Churches may have different liturgical practices in different regions, but they all agreed on the essentials. The fact that the Orthodox Church could contain various traditions and yet still remain unified was a wonderful image of just how united the body of Christ was. It is not known how Victor reacted to Irenaeus, but he likely backed down and let the issue pass. It would be more than a century before controversy over the date of Easter arose again. Irenaeus is mostly remembered today for his magnum opus, often referred to as Against Heresies, but more accurately, On the Refutation and Overthrow of Knowledge Falsely So Called, a reference to 1 Timothy 6.20. A five-book work in which Irenaeus set out to refute the Gnostic heretics and define what genuine Orthodox Catholic Apostolic Christianity really was. You may wish to refresh yourself with Gnosticism by listening to episode 11, where I discussed it in detail. In his first book, based on both Gnostic writings, such as the Gospel of Judas, and his own experience, Irenaeus presented the doctrines of Valentinus and other prominent heresiarchs, including Simon Magus, Saturninus, the Ebionites, Marcion, and Tatian. In the second book, Irenaeus used arguments from reason and logic to refute the heretics. In book three, he refuted them from the scriptures and tradition of the church, in the fourth, he refuted them on the basis of Christ's own words. And book five is concerned with defending the physical bodily resurrection, which the Gnostics obviously rejected because of their anti-materialism. Books three through five are also a detailed presentation of the Orthodox faith. After Against Heresies, Arenas's other major work was a short book called On Apostolic Preaching. In contrast to Against Heresies, this book is not polemical, but rather a positive presentation of the Christian faith. It is mainly derived from these two works that our understanding of Irenaeus theology comes from. Irenaeus is the first theologian, in the academic sense, whose thought we can substantially assess. Therefore, I'm going to give a short overview of some of the key aspects of his beliefs. Irenaeus worked to unite the great church on a common basis while still accepting regional diversity. As John Baer puts it in his book, The Way to Nicaea, quote, Thereafter, Christians were committed to a common body of scriptures, including the apostolic writings, though the extent of the list would be long debated, the canon of truth, apostolic tradition, and succession, in a unity of faith which marked out the great church from the various sects." Unquote. Bear 111-112. There are some important concepts here. Scripture, the canon of truth or rule of faith, apostolic tradition, and apostolic succession. In terms of scripture, the Old Testament was clearly sacrosanct for Irenaeus. Indeed, belief in the Hebrew scriptures as the church's scriptures was a key definer of orthodoxy in the second century. After all, Marcion rejected it and the Gnostics were very ambivalent. But for Irenaeus, the story of the Old Testament was the story of Jesus Christ. He was its ultimate author and the climax it pointed to. The crucified and resurrected Christ could not be understood without the story and the language of the Old Testament. Central to Irenaeus' theology was that the Messiah was slain and rose again, according to the scriptures. Jesus had appeared before his incarnation to Adam in the garden, to Noah, to the patriarchs, and to Moses. In Genesis 19, it was he who appeared before Abraham and called down fire from God the Father on the Sodomites. He is the word of the Lord that revealed the Father to the Hebrews. All of the Old Covenant prophets were prophesying and preaching the Lamb of God, slain and now risen. With Irenaeus, the Christian hermeneutic of finding types and symbols of anything related to Christ and the Church in the Old Testament was in full force. 
Just as Paul had compared Jesus with the first man, saying he was a second Adam, so Irenaeus took this further and stated Mary was a second Eve. The first Adam and Eve brought death through their disobedience, but Christ, by remaining faithful to the Father, and Mary, by following God's will to bear his Son, death, sin, and Satan were laid low at the cross. Thus, for Irenaeus, the only way to properly understand what the Old Testament is really about was to believe the apostolic gospel of the crucified and risen Jesus. Jesus is the sum, the recapitulation of the Hebrew scriptures. While the Gnostics claimed to have secret traditions and knowledge, Aaron has contrasted this with the public doctrine of the church and the public succession of bishops from the apostles. He pointed out how if the supposed teachings the Gnostics claimed came from Christ, why did not the apostles entrust these to their successors, the bishops and presbyters of the church? Why did not, say, Polycarp, who knew John, ever teach Irenaeus anything close to resembling Gnosticism? While the Gnostics simply asserted a secret chain of transmission, Irenaeus could list great teachers of various churches going back to the apostles and note how they had preserved the apostolic tradition. This tradition was public and open to all. The heretical tradition was secretive, only open to those small lucky few who had the divine spark of Sophia in them. As an example, Irenaeus pointed to the Church of Rome, with its foundations being laid by the two martyred apostles, Peter and Paul. He then went on to list the great leaders of the Roman Church to his day, including the Apostolic Father Clement. All these bishops, he claimed, preserved the apostolic faith. Thus, one can see two dimensions to Irenaeus' view of apostolic succession. Lineage, stretching back to the apostles, and maintaining the apostolic tradition passed on. Christ established his church and put his apostles in charge under him. Then, they in turn proclaimed this faith and way of life and passed the tradition on, both orally and in their writings to the church which Irenaeus asserts is where, by the Holy Spirit, this tradition has been preserved against the heretics. And furthermore, Irenaeus asserted how all throughout the world, every Orthodox Church maintained the same essential faith. This was quite an assertion. One historians today still debate, but Irenaeus clearly believed it to be true. He had contact with his home churches in Gaul, as well as Rome, Asia, and the East. Even though he was not familiar with Alexandria, where Gnosticism thrived, one of our earliest fragments of Against Heresies comes from Egypt around 200 AD. Not long after it was completed, Orthodox Egyptian Christians found his work quite useful in combating the heretics. I will conclude our brief discussion of Irenaeus' theology by quoting the root rule of faith, or canon of truth probably a baptismal creed. He says this sums up the apostolic faith of the church. She believes in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are in them, and in one Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who became incarnate for our salvation, and in the Holy Spirit, who proclaimed through the prophets and the dispensations of God, and the advents and the birth from aversion and the passion, and the resurrection from the dead, and the ascension into heaven, in the flesh of the beloved Christ Jesus, our Lord, and his future manifestation from heaven in the glory of the Father, to gather all things in one, and to raise up anew all flesh of the whole human race, in order that Christ Jesus, our Lord, and God, and Savior, and King, according to the will of the invisible Father, every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess to him, and that he should execute just judgment towards all, that he may send spiritual wickedness, and the angels who transgressed and became apostates, together with the ungodly and unrighteous and wicked and profane among men, into everlasting fire, but may, in the exercise of his grace, 
confer immortality on the righteous and holy and those who have kept his commandments and have preserved in his love some from the beginning of their Christian course and others from the date of their repentance and may surround them with everlasting glory. Against Heresies, Book 1, Chapter 10, Verse 1. Aside from Against Heresies and Apostolic Preaching, very little of Irenaeus' writings survive. Indeed, his two major works survive largely in Latin and Armenian translations, with few actual manuscripts of the original Greek. Fragments of the epistles he wrote mentioned earlier survive, mainly because of Eusebius' excerpts. Lost to us is Irenaeus' apologetic book against pagans called On Knowledge, as well as another book on various subjects. It is quite a shame that the writings of this crucial figure and steadfast servant of the church suffered such a fate. The fate of Irenaeus himself is not even exactly known. Most likely he died of old age around 200 AD. There is a late and unreliable tradition that he was martyred. Perhaps the greatest insult to Irenaeus' legacy in subsequent history was the destruction of his tomb and remains by French iconoclasts in the 16th century. We have now finally come to the end of the 2nd century. Well, okay, not exactly, but the 190s AD are a good place to mark the end of the 2nd century period of church history, even though not, we're not exactly at year 200 AD. Starting with the Apostolic Fathers, moving into the Apologists, and finally into the major pre-Nicene bishops like Victor and Irenaeus, we have seen the church struggle and grow, beset by Jewish and Roman persecution, as well as internal problems of heresy and schism, the Christian church had now reached a new high point in its life. Against all odds, it remained united. With Irenaeus, it was becoming more mature in its understanding of its own beliefs. It also had a unique identity that was neither Jewish nor Greek, but authentically Christian. It had communities as far west as Gaul and Carthage, and as far east as Mesopotamia and India. In these communities, the bishops had risen to become the leaders, and the bishops of the Catholic Church remained in contact with one another. This foundation of unity and strong leadership was necessary for the survival of the Church in the 3rd century, as will become painfully obvious in future episodes. There were rivals, such as the Judaizers, Gnostics, Marcionites, and Montanists, but they had neither the cohesion nor the numbers to displace the Orthodox. Though pagans chided Christians as holding blind faith, intellectuals within the church clearly countered that charge. In time, Christianity would soon move from a despised cult to a more established, and even somewhat respected religion in the Greco-Roman world, the work of the apologists finally paying off. But the capstone of the achievements of the second century Great Church was the New Testament canon. By the end of the second century, the majority of what was to be included in the New Covenant scriptures was firmly established throughout all the Orthodox churches. Next episode, we will take a break from the narrative to examine the origins and development of the Church's New Testament canon up to circa 190 AD. We will examine which books were gained in acceptance and which were not, why Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were chosen, while other Gospels rejected. Thank you again for listening. Please comment, review, and subscribe. If you have questions or thoughts about the podcast, you can email me at historyoftheearlychurch at gmail.com. Please visit the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash earlychurchpodcast, and be sure to check out the website at historyoftheearlychurch.wordpress.com.
History of the Early Church. Episode 19. We need a canon, don't we? Last episode, we looked at the greatest Christian theologian of the 2nd century, Irenaeus of Lyons. Today we examine in detail one of the central fruits of the Christian unity Irenaeus championed, the biblical canon. When and how did the early church begin to collect and canonize the documents known as the New Testament? The process that led to the canonical New Testament began with the writing of the documents themselves, after the Gospels, various apostolic epistles, and Revelation were written, they had to be widely circulated and read by Christians across the ancient world. Next, they needed to be recognized as having divine status, equal to the books of the Old Testament. Collections of the books were made. Finally, there was the matter of actually creating fixed lists of what in these collections was to be universally held to as scripture, that is, what in these collections was part of the church's canon. Before we begin, I should inform you that my two principal scholarly sources for the following information are the New Testament canon, its origin, development, and significance by Bruce Metzger, and the biblical canon, its origin, transmission, and authority by Lee Martin MacDonald. If you want more information on the biblical canon, I highly recommend you pick up these two titles. The Greek word kanon originally referred to a straight rod or measuring stick. The uses of the word in Greek literature, both pagan and early Christian, often meant a fixed or established standard to evaluate by a rule defining what was normative. Christians would go on to eventually use this term in three ways specific to them. The canon of truth, or rule of faith, discussed in the previous episode. Canons of the church, or church law. And the list of books considered to be part of the Holy Bible. It is the latter which concerns us here. The idea of having a list of sacred writings was not a Christian invention, but an inheritance from Second Temple Judaism and the Old Testament. By the way, I will not be discussing the history of the Christian Old Testament canon. That topic will be saved for a future episode. Jesus himself never wrote any books, nor, besides Revelation, ever commissioned the apostles to do so either. In the first century, both Jews and Greeks often considered oral tradition to be equally or more important than written tradition. But at some point, the impetus to write down a record of the words and deeds of Christ came about. Before and during this time, though, apostles such as Paul were already engaged in writing epistles to fellow Christians, using the oral tradition of the church as a source for authority. It was not self-evident in the first decades of the church that a new collection of holy writ would come about to stand alongside the Old Testament. Even in the time of the Apostolic Fathers, when Christian authors cited the scriptures, they were referring to the Old Testament, specifically the Greek Septuagint. But as the second century progressed, the writings of the apostles gradually became seen as comprising a New Testament. When did this process begin? How soon were the Gospels and Apostolic Epistles viewed as divine scripture? The second epistle of Peter, chapter 3, refers to the letters of the apostle Paul, possibly as scripture, akin to the Old Testament. If Peter himself actually wrote this letter, then not only did a collection of Paul's letters exist, but they may have already been likened to the Old Testament no later than the mid-60s AD. Alas, though, much doubt and controversy exists over the authorship of 2 Peter, 
both ancient and modern. However, the notion that Paul's letters were collected sometime in the 1st or early 2nd century is highly probable. Collected correspondences were often published in the ancient world. As we shall see, there is good reason to think that a collection of the 13 Pauline epistles existed early on. So, perhaps this is the beginning, in some ways, of the New Testament canon. All the documents in the New Testament were composed between roughly 50 and 100 AD. I will not digress into the thorny issue of dating the four Gospels or other writings. However, it should be noted that the four Gospels in the New Testament are the only Gospels of antiquity that can be dated to the first century. Shortly after being written, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were widely distributed and read across the early Christian communities. The emergence of the fourfold gospel tradition would be a prominent mark of the great church. It has been speculated that it was because of this that early Christians made great use of the codex, the early form of a book, as opposed to scrolls, so that all four gospels could be read together. The Christians whose views we shall examine first on this matter are the Apostolic Fathers. We discussed these Disciples of the Apostles primarily in Episodes 8 and 9. You may wish to refresh yourself with those episodes before we continue in our analysis, as I will not be reintroducing each individual Apostolic Father. Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp of Smyrna and the authors of the Didache had access to both written and oral tradition concerning Jesus and apostolic teaching. They considered the words of the Lord and tradition of the apostles authoritative, regardless of the medium they had received it in. Aside from the Didache, all of them probably had access to a collection of Paul's letters. None of them, though, with one possible exception, refer to the New Testament texts as scripture. For them, canonical scripture meant the Old Testament. The one exception is Polycarp, who may have called Paul's epistle to the Ephesian scripture, but this is uncertain. It is with Papias of Herapolis that our first real discussion of the relationship between oral and written tradition is found. In the fragments of his book, Exposition of the Sayings of the Lord, Papias explains his preference for oral over written tradition. By no means, though, did Papias reject written texts. He was familiar with the Gospel of John, 1 John, 1 Peter, and Revelation. In his work, Papias interpreted the sayings of Jesus by using apostolic oral tradition he received from presbyters who had known the apostles themselves, perhaps Jewish refugees from Judea after the destruction of the temple by Titus in 70 AD. It is not clear if Papias knew the apostle John, the son of Zebedee, or another apostolic figure, John the Presbyter. The relationship between these two Johns is a debated mystery in early Christian studies. Papias is the first to attest to the notion that Matthew wrote his gospel originally in a Semitic language, either Hebrew or, more likely, Aramaic. He also defended the gospel of Mark by attesting that the source behind it was the apostle Peter. Mark's writing may not have been exhaustive or followed strict chronology, but Peter was its source, and so it could be trusted. Like other early Christian writers, Papias also knew of Agrapha, sayings of Jesus not found in the four Gospels, but in oral tradition. With Papias, the need for the words of the Lord Jesus to be found in trustworthy texts was becoming more important, no doubt in part because the apostles had all died and heretics were distorting the Master's teaching. Speaking of said heretics, the Gnostic tide that invaded the church in the early 2nd century jostled the Orthodox Christians into seeing the need to determine which books were apostolic 
and true, which books were false, false forgeries, and how the works of the apostles were supposed to be interpreted. Gnostics used both the New Testament Gospels and their own, as well as letters of the apostles they had forged, and authentic ones, to promote their Gnostic doctrines. I will discuss some of these and other rejected books towards the end of the episode. The proliferation of forged works did, however, mean the church had to respond and show why only the four Gospels were from the Apostles, and secret traditions of the Gnostics had no claim to authority. But as much as the Gnostics jostled the church out of its canonical indifference, it was the infamous heresiarch, Marcion of Sinope, who really gave the Catholics a big, fat wake-up call. Marcion was the heretic we met back in episode 12. He believed the Jewish creator god of the Old Testament was an evil being, and the Judaizers had corrupted the writings of Paul. For Marcion, only Paul understood Jesus, and only Marcion understood Paul. He accepted only the Gospel of Luke, given that Luke was a disciple of Paul. He also edited and removed from Paul and Luke anything that seemed Jewish or positive towards the Hebrew Scriptures. The effect this all had on the Church was that it compelled the Orthodox to think more deeply and articulate more firmly its beliefs concerning the Apostolic Writings. Clearly, a collection of Paul's letters existed at the time for Marcin to edit. The four Gospels were also widely circulated and recognized in some way, thus Marcin could reject three of them while accepting Luke. And of course, like the Gnostics, he inadvertently entrenched the Church's acceptance of the Old Testament as its holy scriptures. Marcin is, however, the first Christian, albeit a heretic, who took the idea of a literary canon and sought to firmly demarcate its boundary among the apostolic writings. Ironically, this this idea ultimately came from the Old Testament, which he so vehemently despised. From Marcion onward, momentum in the church began to push for a more defined canon. I'm not going to go through every Christian writer of the 2nd century, but I think it will suffice to give a picture of the general trends in the church, as well as some regional particularities. The various apologists, such as Justin Martyr and Athenagoras, and early bishops like Melito and Dionysius, quote from, allude to, or are clearly influenced by the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The tradition of the four Gospels was so widespread that Irenaeus at the end of the 2nd century could speak of the canon of the Gospels as effectively closed. These four biographies of the Lord were the ones known early on across all churches from Gaul to Osroene. These were the collections of Jesus' words and deeds read in parishes throughout the ancient world. The four Gospels became the marker of orthodoxy. Even Tatian, the student of Justin who left the church and founded the Encratite sect, did not break from the fourfold gospel tradition. He produced in the 170s a harmony of the four gospels called the Diatessaron, originally in Greek and then later translated into Syriac. Syriac is a dialect of Aramaic spoken widely in ancient Osroene, Mesopotamia, and Persia. So popular was this work of Tatians that many Syriac-speaking Christians preferred it over the regular four Gospels, down to the 4th and 5th centuries. The 13 epistles of the Apostle Paul were also universally held to, though Marcion's usage of them made some Christians uneasy about directly citing Paul's work. Nevertheless, a two-part canon was developing, the Gospels, and the epistles of the apostles. Of course, anything from Jesus, either directly or through the apostles, was authoritative, but the idea of these texts as scripture was slow to develop. Practically, there may not have made much of 
a difference in the life of the everyday church. But starting around the 170s, we begin to see these writings recognized as divine scripture in conjunction with the Old Testament. Dionysius of Corinth and Theophilus of Antioch clearly viewed the Gospels and Paul as inspired by the Holy Spirit and on the same level as the Old Testament. As Justin Martyr had testified earlier, these writings were read publicly in the churches along with Moses and the prophets. Irenaeus could speak quite confidently of the letters of Paul standing with the Gospels as sacrosanct and canonical. So from the earliest days, the four Gospels and a collection of Paul's letters were widely distributed and read. These 17 books formed the bare bones of the New Testament canon, and by the end of the second century, they were wholly divinely inspired scripture. The writings in and of themselves came to have inherent divine authority, not simply the teachings within them. The eyewitnesses of Jesus and the apostles had fallen asleep or were martyred. Their legacy survived chiefly in these writings. We must now turn to three related matters. What books were considered to be on the fringe of the canon, accepted by some and questioned by others? What books were flat out rejected by the great church? And what criteria did the church fathers use to determine if a book was canonical or not? The third is perhaps most important, so I will start there. The criteria used to determine which books became part of the canon were Apostolicity, Orthodoxy, and Catholicity. Of first importance was Apostolicity. Was the document written by an apostle or a disciple of the apostles? Gospels forged in the name of Thomas, Mary Magdalene, or Peter were firmly rejected on this basis. Second was Orthodoxy. The existence of the Christian Church obviously preceded the existence of the New Testament, and hence the Christian faith preceded the existence of Christian writings. So, if a writing was to be accepted as canonical, it had to be in agreement with the Orthodox faith of the Catholic Church, or the Rule of Faith, or Canon of Truth, as expounded by Irenaeus. Christians had always confessed one God, the Father, His Word, and Son, Jesus Christ, and His Holy Spirit. So, if a document came along and argued for, say, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and something else in the Godhead, it obviously was not Orthodox. Finally, there was Catholicity. To be a canonical document, the text had to be read publicly in churches, universally, and from the beginning. Certain books may have local authority for certain communities, but the canonical scriptures had to be received by all. So there you have it. Apostolicity, Orthodoxy, and Catholicity. Simple enough, right? But wait, you ask. What about divine inspiration? Or in Greek, Theonustos, literally God breathed. Surely, whether or not a book was Theonustos by the Holy Spirit was the deciding factor in canonization, right? Surprisingly, no. In fact, whether or not a book was Theonustos was not a factor at all. The early church believed many books or even people to be God breathed or inspired by the Holy Spirit. Rather, if a book was scripture, it was by virtue of that fact, Theonustos, not the other way around. Divine inspiration was never used to discriminate which books were in the canon. Lots of texts could have truth from God, but only those with the authority of the apostles, in harmony with the canon of truth, and universally received from the beginning, could enjoy the status of canonicity. With these three criteria, the remainder of the New Testament canon would be sorted out. You will notice that ten documents were absent from the Gospel Pauline core. 
Luke's Acts of the Apostles, the letters of Peter, John, James, Jude, the anonymous epistle to the Hebrews, and, of course, the book of Revelation. I should say up front that the Acts of the Apostles should probably be considered part of the Gospel Paul core, as it was accepted early on in conjunction with the Gospel of Luke. So that leaves nine documents that had to struggle to make their way in. Much of the debate over these books occurred after the second century, so I will be brief. Though these books had circulated fairly widely, their apostolic authorship was doubted by many. Second Peter, Second and Third John, and Jude, along with James, were less easily received than, say, First Peter or First John. But the two books that had the hardest time making it into the canon were Hebrews and Revelation. Hebrews was known as early as Clement of Rome and used fairly widely, but it was anonymous. Who knew if it came from Paul or one of his disciples or someone else? The church fathers had to critically examine this question. The book of Revelation was met with a lot of skepticism because of its bizarre content. Anyone who's read the book of Revelation can probably attest to that. Was it actually written by the Apostle John? Or maybe the mysterious John the Presbyter? In Rome, an entire sect called the Elogi sprung up around 200 or so and rejected Revelation and the epistles of John as forgeries by the heresy arch Serenthus, mentioned back in episode 8. The Elogi even went so far as to reject the Gospel of John, placing themselves outside the mainstream of the church. There were other books received in certain communities that, while viewed as authoritative, did not come to be held as canonical by the church as a whole. Many of these books we have already encountered. In Corinth, for instance, Clement's epistle was read in church, but probably not elsewhere. The Church of Rome held both the Shepherd of Hermas, discussed in episode 12, and the Apocalypse of Peter, mentioned in episode 10, as canonical. Our knowledge of what the Church of Rome accepted as canonical circa 190 AD comes from a remarkable document called the Muratorian Fragment. It gives a list of the apostolic writings accepted and read in the Orthodox Roman community. It lists the four Gospels, Acts, the 13 epistles of Paul, while rejecting two letters of Paul forged by the Marcionites, the letter of Jude, and two letters of John. After that, the Second Temple pre-Christian Jewish book called The Wisdom of Solomon is perplexedly listed in the canon. Why this is so is unknown, even to modern scholars. Next, it lists Revelation and the Apocalypse of Peter, though the author acknowledges that many others do not read the Apocalypse of Peter in church. Finally, it names the Shepherd of Hermas as a recent work composed by Hermas, the brother of Bishop Pius. The Shepherd of Hermas is considered as a sort of deuterocanonical text not to be read publicly with the apostles and prophets in church, but useful for private reading. The text ends with a denunciation of the works of Valentinus, Marcion, Basilides, and other heretical writers. To wrap up our discussion of the canon, we will briefly examine books explicitly rejected by the great church. As mentioned above, the works of Valentinus, Marcion, and other heretics and their followers were rejected. Their writings failed either one, two, or all three of the criteria. The secret apostolic tradition of the Gnostics was rejected. Being secret, it could not prove its faithful transmission of doctrine, like the public tradition and apostolic succession of the Catholic Church. Their writings were often forged in the name of apostles like Thomas, Philip, Mary Magdalene, Peter, etc., and were of recent invention, never known to anyone in the church beforehand. And of course, their contents did not agree often with the public faith 
of the Orthodox Church. Some notable examples are as follows. Irenaeus mentions the Gnostic Gospel of Judas, which he denounces as false. This text was written probably around 160 AD. With much fanfare, this book has now recently come to light by the work of the National Geographic Society. It is commonly thought that this gospel portrays Judas as a hero, following Jesus' direct orders to get the Lord arrested so that the authorities will crucify and kill the mortal man whom the divine Aeon Jesus has assumed, thus allowing the divine Jesus to return to the play Roma and leave his fleshly prison. Scholar Nicholas Perrin, in his book Tatian and Thomas, has made an interesting case that the Gospel of Thomas was dependent on Tatian's Diatessaron, although other scholars have disputed this. Thomas, though, is clearly a 2nd century work from Syria, and reflects dependence on the four canonical Gospels. It also contains strange teachings attributed to Jesus, such as the notion that salvation for women means becoming men. Whatever that means. Finally, Eusebius records an interesting story about the so-called Gospel of Peter. Theophilus of Antioch was succeeded as bishop by a certain Maximin, who in turn was succeeded by the renowned Serapion near the end of the 2nd century. Serapion was a prominent leader and determined opponent of the Montanist heresy. He was asked for permission by the Church of Rosas on the coast of Cilicia if they could read the Gospel of Peter in church, apparently in addition to the four Gospels. Serapion was initially fine with this and he saw no real problem. But shortly thereafter, Serapion was able to read the Gospel of Peter for himself and saw plainly that it was tainted with the Docetus heresy, the heresy the Apostle John fought in Asia, which denied the humanity of Christ. Here, the orthodoxy of the document was used to rule out its apostolicity by Serapion. Interestingly, Serapion did not appeal to the fourfold Gospel tradition, though it seems that the reading of the Gospel of Peter was a regional peculiarity in Rosas, and so Serapion probably initially viewed the text as the deuterocanon of the local church, similar to the Shepherd of Hermas in Rome. A document called the Gospel of Peter is extant today, and like the other apocryphal Gospels, one can see the marked differences between it and the church's canonical four. So, that wraps up our lengthy discussion of the New Testament canon up to the end of the 2nd century. Next episode, we will resume the narrative and begin the 3rd century in Roman Africa, where we will, shall encounter the father of Latin Christianity, Tertullian of Carthage. Thank you for listening. If you have questions or thoughts about the podcast, please email me at historyoftheearlychurch at gmail.com. Don't forget to leave a review on iTunes, post a comment on the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash earlychurchpodcast, and be sure to check out the website at historyofthearlychurch.com.